Hey, I'm Sith King. And I'm Sonic Sons. We're the Rambling Reviewers. And today we're looking at a show that's uh, new to you, but I've been into it for a couple of years now. We're looking at the first two seasons of Steven Universe. Which, uh, what was it, two days ago, you're like, you know, so I, I've decided maybe I'll give this a try. And we just binged two seasons worth over the last couple of days. Yeah. And now we're here to review it. So, it uh, should It should be noted what made me get into it. Yeah. Uh, the show is derisively and accurately referred to as being about magical lesbian space rocks. Again, this is accurate. And it's awesome. <laughs> okay, yes. But it turns out that these lesbian magical space rocks... No, no, sorry. Magical lesbian space rocks. We must, <laughs> I uh, don't know. <laughs> I, I just think that the magic should be emphasized before the lesbian aspect. Okay. Um... Anyways, are from a planet called Homeworld. Now, if you know me, and I'm assuming you do, you know that I love the video game Homeworld, which is a 3D real-time strategy game where you control fleets, build them, and, well, it's completely freaking awesome. My only complaint is that I haven't seen a good Windows port in a while, so I haven't played it. I haven't played it Since ever. I remember reading about it college. in a magazine back when there were magazines about gaming. Yeah. And I was like, this looks super cool. <laughs> I forgot to play that game. It is. It's a story about how the on a distant desert desert world known as Karak, the Higar the Karak, uh, the people were confused about why their planet was dying until they found a ancient wreck spaceship. It was revealed that they were prisoners long ago, and that this was their prison planet. So, they built spaceships based on that technology, only for the Titani Empire to realize, Hey, the prisoners are escaping! Not knowing that the prisoners didn't know that they were prisoners. I, I'm skipping and combining some details, so they didn't know they were prisoners, but they revealed that they... Uh, the Originally, they didn't know they were... Yeah, you said that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, anyways... The first Homeworld game is about a trip across the galaxy for the survivors of Karak's destruction to defeat the Tidani Empire and return to their homeworld of Higara. There was a spin-off game where one of the clans of the Higarans, um, well, they split off and went to the Galactic Core to mine for resources because they were already so small they needed to make sure they wouldn't get assimilated by the rest of the clans. This led to them fighting, well, the Flood on steroids. I'm not joking here either. But that's not important because I didn't play either of those games. Uh, the game that I played was Homeworld 2, where the Higarans, well, formerly the people from Karak, but now they're called Higarans because they're from Higara, have realized that, oh shit, this race called the Vagar is starting to emerge from the Galactic Rim, and they're starting to conquer all of our colonies. We need to get the mothership back online and get our ships in order and get ready to fight off the enemy. In the meantime, they also discover ancient galactic mysteries relating to the first race to, and most advanced race in the galaxy, the Precursors. Now, as you can expect, when I heard that there was a show involving Homeworld, I was really excited. <laughs> but you know all that awesome exposition and uh, great 3D real-time strategy stuff? That has nothing to do with this show. It's just the name of their planet because the gems apparently have shitty imaginations. Yeah, I mean, as far as naming things go. Yeah, seriously. All of the gems are named after what rock they're based on. Which means if you happen to know more than one ruby, guess what? They're all named ruby. I mean, Peridot did eventually go something along the lines of... Oh, yeah, she's got like I'm a serial facets, number. facets, yeah. whatever. So people do have, like, numbers to distinguish them. Yeah, I just find it interesting that the Crystal Gems fought this rebellion for personal freedom so that they could be considered unique, and they're still referred to by their type of gem. I guess they never felt the need to change that. I'm just saying, you know. Hmm. Uh, in reality, the show is not, well, like I said. Anyways, um... Part of the reason why I didn't want to get into Steven Universe was because I saw the first few episodes, where I saw a bunch of cliches. I didn't really see what the show would become. Um, it stars the main cast, Steven Universe. Yes, that is his, his real name. His first name is Steven, his last name is Universe. I have to explain that to people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who is a half-human, half-gem hybrid. 
Uh, the gems are the crystal gems are the three local magical girl superheroes who protect the world from uh, monsters and stuff. You know, the, the magical girl label isn't completely accurate because although they have magic powers and they are girls and they fight evil, they don't have quite that same aesthetic aesthetic they don't do the transformation sequence where they become kind of naked for a second and all those, those cliches associated with magical girls uh, um garnet is, and uh is got this this aloof attitude that you never see in a magical girl who's supposed to be like a lot more uh perky i guess and cutesy um, and stuff i don't know magical girls tend to run the gamut uh you think pretty so? much any, any time Okay, well, that goes like, back to I don't to think the... any of them is actually the cutesy thing that I'm thinking of. I mean, maybe I didn't see enough Magical Girl shows, but the ones I yeah, saw were cutesy. It, it tend to, Yeah, they tend to be a little more cutesy, though the personalities of the Magical Girls te tend to, ever since Sailor Moon, run the gamut of multiple different personality types so that everyone has a best girl that they can root for. I mean, I suppose that is true. Okay, anyway, they are... the superheroes of our setting yes uh there is garnet who is huge and has uh guts man fists she is also 100 percent mom <laughs> yeah we can't that was like a little uh, um meme or whatever you came up with while we were, we were watching every time garnet would say something mom like 100 percent mom <laughs> yeah the rest aren't really mom no, i, I would say pearl is, is pearl up is there. somewhat pearl a mom is totally up but there. Uh, but like, Amethyst is totally just big sister, like like you know, okay. almost the same age as Steven is the idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm uh, though I think Pearl tries a little too hard to mom, whereas Garnet seems to do it effortlessly. This too, Garnet does everything effortlessly. I mean, comparatively to Pearl, who likes to get all freak out about stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one thing that's kind of intriguing about the Crystal Gems is they all have completely different body types and completely different personalities. Yeah, no one's is a cookie cutter of another person's. Unless it's like, there's a reason for it. Yeah, nobody. Never like wants the rubies. To like the rubies. Even they have, end up having uh, distinctions. Yeah, but they're pretty similar. Is what I'm trying to get from at. from what you've seen thus far. Which and this is a fun bit because you've only seen the first two seasons, and I am waiting for. I think there was an episode that came out yesterday, or will come out tomorrow, and then we got to catch you up all the way. But we're working on it. Yes. <laughs> so, anyways, uh. So these three sort of mature women women are defending the world, going and saving these ancient relics, which we assume. Okay, turn that off. Good. <laughs> okay then, saving the world, fighting monsters, while putting up with Steven. And I'm gonna be honest here, Steven was one of the reasons I didn't want to get into this show, because science fiction and fantasy writers seem to have this thing that they believe namely that we didn't hate wesley crusher or adric or anyone of another obviously immature children who somehow have magical or special abilities that mean they have to stay in contact with the much more interesting characters this is a thing to try to humanize the characters to try to make it so that the little kids watching can relate to them saying oh yes i could totally hang out with the crystal gems I could be a Power Ranger, even though I haven't learned what multiplication is. <laughs> I'm... Power Rangers, multiply! <laughs> Just, yeah. like, do a math problem and hand it to the... I have the ability... <laughs> I could save the Enterprise by being a prick who's, uh, <laughs> you know, the creator of the show's personal author avatar. Uh, well, uh, the, the writer's strike contributed to that. You know the whole story there? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. But at the same time... Ah, he obviously came across bad to the audience in the end. Yeah, that's what, that's the audience season. In like, the end, how many times does Wesley get to save the day? I know. Well, there was also... It wasn't just that. There was ways he was portrayed even beyond that. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. which was part of... Partly because he was, again, the author avatar of uh, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Wesley Roddenberry. Oh, I never knew that part. Yeah, so we'd get Wesley being able to do shit that people who have worked on this equipment for years they can't do, despite the fact that he's like 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so but... th there's actually two ways to do this wrong. One is to make the kid hyper-competent and he comes off all Mary Sue-ish. And the other way is to make him so incompetent that why is he even part of the plot? He's just like the load for everyone else to carry around. 
which admittedly was how Steven was portrayed at first. I want to go on a mission even though I don't have any weapons, magical ability, or any reason to exist other than to put myself in danger. Yep. Yeah. He's endearing that way. But he's a nice kid, and honestly, you know, I could... I could see if someone was willing to give it a chance, they could grow to like this character. At least thinking that at first. I did not think that way. I thought, here is the irritating, irritating load-bearing character who just happens to be here because of circumstance that was contrived so that the authors couldn't just get rid of him. I could see that going poorly. Thankfully, it did not go poorly in the end. <laughs> yeah. What this show excels at is, well, four things. One, music. There's a lot of music. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Two, emotional drama. Yeah. Three. Um, shit. Uh, continuity, which is another make or break thing for me. If a show has continuity, that means they care enough about their own past that it's not just a series of one shot episodes. Mm -hmm. Four is something I can't remember at the Character moment. Character development, I'm going to guess. Uh, no, actually, it wasn't that. It oh. was. Um, it should be on the list. Hmm. It should have been. Crap. I forgot what my point was. Huh. Oh, yes. Slow world building. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are very good at that. Yeah, so innocuous details can just be slipped into episodes, and suddenly they show up. They build a lot of mystery that way. In fact, I remember when I saw the very first episode, I wasn't sure it was the first episode, because <laughs> there's no exposition to speak of. It's just uh, Stephen's upset that his uh, favorite uh, ice cream... Uh, ice cream sandwich thing whatever is not available anymore and then he like runs home to tell people and those people are fighting monsters and they're all chill about it and oh there was a reference to steven having a magic belly button and you're just like wait what, is, what was i supposed to know everything and you don't know everything and that's that's the yeah, what makes it intriguing you know they do a, a sort of medius res not in the middle of the main plot but in the middle of the situation uh where a, a another creator might have made it like you know have a big old prologue and explain stuff to you and that would have actually made it more boring they just drop you in and uh, which admittedly does hurt the story initially 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 meaning that you're expected to know all this information but it comes across as we just drop these people in here to try to fight monsters because that's what puts butts in seats <laughs> you could see how that comes across wrong yeah I personally think things really started changing. Okay, things have been slowly building with character, actual character development, different music, different songs. Things are getting better. But I think what really cemented this show as worth sticking around for was the first two-parter in the series. Steven Universe is divided into 10-minute episodes. Uh, occasionally, they'll go into two-parters, which means it's basically a full episode for an animated series. But it starts off with Steven and his best friend Connie talking on the phone where it's revealed that Steven doesn't go to school, which kind of bugs me for some reason. Just I mean, homeschooling is a perfectly viable alternative. I guess it would be nice to see someone teaching Steven something at some point. Yeah, especially I... since the reason Steven's supposed to be here at the temple that they live in is because they're supposed to be teaching him i mean they, well they are teaching okay i should say not something something like they do they trying to teach him how to summon his shield and how to do fusion and other things he needs to know as a gem warrior uh just one little scene where like greg is teaching him how to read or or not teaching him how to read but maybe like uh teaching him something slightly more advanced than that and you'd be like oh okay so he gets like the occasional lesson whatever I'm a proponent of unschooling anyway, but there Whereas, some moment where he's learning that stuff might have been nice to throw in a little You're detail. a fan of un I'm a fan of schooling. You're a fan of unschooling. I think we can both agree there should have been some moment where Steven's learning something. Something academic, maybe, yeah. yeah. I'm schooling, he's unschooling. Steven is no schooling. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, what he just assume, assume apparently learned this stuff off screen, because he reads quite fine. Yeah. Uh, uh Although, interestingly, we do get hints as to his backstory and why his mom isn't around. Yeah, they do a whole bunch of stuff with families of different non-nuclear settings. Yeah, yeah, a lot of variety. I mean, in, in many ways, variety okay. of race, variety of species, variety of gender, variety of personality. I mean, one family <laughs> with the onions, it's implied that this is like 
the the wife of the family is uh, this Vidalia. is her second marriage. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Uh, and there she has a kid from a previous marriage and there's tension between the stepfather and his stepson Sour Cream yeah. because of course his name is Sour Cream because this whole family is onion themed. <laughs> but it's not because you're not my real dad, it's because his dad wants him to go into the family business. Yeah. It's, it's not like I want you to be something you're not. I mean, it is. It is, but in a but different it, way from the traditional. You're I don't want you thing. to do something unreasonable. I want you to do this thing that's also reasonable and might pan out better for you in the future than I a mean, DJ maybe job. we haven't exactly heard the arguments of Yellowtail because he talks in a mumble, which I think is just a, a metaphor for a foreign language he speaks. He's from somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. There's stuff going on in the background. Steven's learning stuff. Uh, occasionally he meets someone new. Occasionally he gets some weird... They fight a bunch of gem monsters. That uh, kind of... Okay, like I said, Steven learns that he hasn't ever gone to school. And oh, yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't know what partner. school is. Okay, then. <laughs> uh, so Connie tells him all about school. So he tries to set up his own school. So that Pearl can teach him things. Which makes me wonder more about what the hell his education was like. But Pearl instead gives him a magic mirror, because of course she does. And this magic mirror is capable of revealing anything that it's seen before. It shows them nothing, actually. <laughs> but, and here's the interesting bit, it starts showing off things that it has seen since Stephen picked it up. And it does so in sequence to make sentences after a while. So eventually it's sort of revealed that this is not, in fact, some random magical artifact. But it's alive. Dun, dun, dun. And Steven starts to make friends with it. Unfortunately, when he tries to reveal this to his friends, the Crystal Gems, they kind of overreact in a way that I don't understand, really. Maybe you will understand more when you've seen more of the show. Well, maybe, <laughs> yes, but they immediately try to get rid of it, possibly to throw it in some, in their prison thing, in the basement, because they actually have a prison in their basement for things they capture. Steven objects to this, and eventually the mirror manages to convince him, remove the gem from my back, from the back of the mirror, and that will allow me to be free. It's revealed that this is actually a gem. See, gems aren't people like you or I are. Well, they are people, but... Hmm. Their physiology is vastly different. I've compared... Yesterday, two days ago, I spent a whole bunch of time comparing gems to a bunch of other fictional creatures, one of which was the angels. Specifically, each gem is named that because they are a... Uh, physical rock oh angels from evangelion i was going with weeping angels for a no second there. no not weeping <laughs> angels look any series with the kids in it with weeping angels is one that i don't want to be a part of yeah <laughs> or watch okay yeah i mean i guess um, sarah jane adventures is technically in the same universe as the weeping angels but let's not go there for right now um anyway angels from ava have a core this, this circular the sphere in the middle there and you can't kill the rest of the being unless you've killed the core which is how they how gems work. The rest of the body that we see, the person that looks like a humanoid, is not actually the person. It's their little gem. The rest of them is merely a hard light hologram that's capable of interacting with the rest of the world and communicating. Literally, you could stab them and all that happens is that they regenerate in a few hours or weeks in some cases. Yeah, except that this new gem, Lapis, her gem was installed and forced to power and be the central processing unit of this mirror thing. And you know, for some reason, being trapped there for thousands of years did not make her happy. No. So she steals all the water in the world. At and least this is not all that we can see. <laughs> and this is not played for laughs or anything. This is like a serious threat to the town. Yeah. Even though they mostly seem concerned about how will... this will affect the tourism industry. <laughs> yeah. People in this world are very chill about the superhero stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they are at least concerned about the disappearance of the ocean. Yeah, but it's eventually revealed that 
Lapis, that's this person's name that I've mentioned several times, uh, her gem is broken, so she's a little bit brain damaged. And... To be precise, cracked as opposed to shattered. Because if you're shattered, you're dead, and if you're cracked, you're like disabled, vaguely speaking. Yeah, Depends you're... on the crack and who you are and all that. Mm-hmm. Then, um, uh, so Steven eventually goes and talks to her, but along the way there's some revelations. Steven says, gems shouldn't fight gems. You should all be on the same side. Then they reveal a whole bunch of truths. All those monsters that we've been seeing, those were gems. Those were originally people. Like, the whole time you thought they were just monsters, like they were born that way? No, they were all people. And then they were corrupted somehow, which... To my knowledge, they have not covered how that happens. They haven't covered it yet. We'll get to it later. Okay, then. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a thing. Uh, they also reveal that gems are from space, that these the crystal gems are rebels, and that things are messed up. Yeah, because the main government is all fascist and stuff. Steven eventually uses his... Okay... This requires a bit of explanation of Steven's backstory. The reason why the Crystal Gems accept him so readily is not because he's half gem. As we just established, they, they don't really have the same comradeship that other gems might have for one another. Or adherence to the caste system would be a little more accurate to yeah, describe how gems see. on Homeworld act. Yeah. Turns out that Steven's mother was their leader, Rose Quartz. Rose decided that she wanted to have a child with a human. Uh, specifically Greg. Greg is not your typical person that you would imagine an alien space rebel to fall in love with, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool guy, though. Yeah, we like Greg. Greg is cool. So instead of the normal biological reproductive process, she instead uh, grows a womb inside of herself because her body is just malleable hard light, creates a physical body for Steven... And then passes on her powers and her gem to the baby, which terminates her existence. Yeah. And uh, even to the present day, we're not sure quite how that happened or completely what motivated her to do that. Like, it's great that you want to be a mom, but this is quite a sacrifice to pay. Yeah, if you want to be a mom, self-sacrifice seems to be the opposite of that goal. Like, maybe adoption would have worked better for you, but, uh, you know, presumably there was more to it. Because one of the things we've learned is that Rose keeps secrets, so, I don't know. She's also Even a I troll. She might also be a troll. She's absolutely a troll. There's no <laughs> might about it. Um, Steven, so that means Steven has the ability to summon gem weapons. He also has the ability to create bubble shields. And, rather impressively, he has healing gifts, meaning that he's the white mage. Yeah, and what do you know? The guy of the group is the white mage. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't really expect that. I mean, it's usually the woman who is the, or the girl who is the white mage. I don't know why. I seem to recall at least one hero who goes by the name of the doctor, who seems to be perfectly capable of being not the white man wait I the doctor to... doesn't normally heal people in that physical sense he yes, goes he around does. and blows things up with amazing clever tricks well he sometimes heals people It'd be funny if that was his actual deal was just being a field medic the whole time <laughs> i can see him doing that oh uh, yeah anyways uh so steven manages to cure lapis and lapis flies away into space by the way, her previous plan was to build a tower out of the world's oceans that would be tall enough to reach another star system. If you think this plan sounds stupid, don't worry. You have a functioning brain. <laughs> but it's impressive at the same time that you managed to get to the stratosphere, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. But the reason why I say this is such a turning point is that it kind of starts shift, showing the shift from... We're doing random magical shit today to there's a purpose behind this magical shit and why we're doing it. Yeah. Turns out that the gems colonized this world thousands of years ago until Rose Quartz decided, hey, um, this might cause problems for the locals. Um, maybe we shouldn't do this. Homeworld apparently laughed her off. And then a war happened where Rose Quartz recruited a bunch of gems to her side to fight against Homeworld and drive them off of the Earth. 
That's also why home, there's a bunch of magic glass structures and crystal abominations running around this place. This used to be a gem colony. Um, and now we're worried that Homeworld might want to take their stuff back. Yeah. Which, okay. Let's be fair here. At this point in the series, humans are not shown in the best light. Namely, they don't give a fuck about anything that isn't <laughs> their own mediocre existences. Um, I don't think this series is trying to cast a pall on the human race so much as they want to do slice of life bits and this is the way to make it happen. And the one partial excuse for that is if the gems have been around openly for thousands of years, it's just possible that people have gotten used to that and it's not considered that weird anymore. But yes, more realistically, like, the federal government would want to have them on hotline and all this other stuff, and it just doesn't uh, Look, happen. I just think that there should be more of a reaction to an alien mm. battle cruiser yeah. slams into the beach and explodes in a massive fireball that takes out the windows of half the town, then, yeah. huh. Well, back to well, the donut shop. You know, you know something, oh, well, first off, during that, they do evacuate the town, so they had at least a short-term reaction. And secondly, Doctor Who has the same problem. Which, which is why I stopped watching Doctor Who. Oh, yeah? Was that the main reason? Well, yeah. Well, the mostly modern... the writing just got kind of lousy after well, a while. Well, that, and actually it was the episode with the trees where the Doctor openly said, Oh, yeah, no one's going to remember yeah. this. <laughs> Despite the fact that there was video evidence of it happening. Well, I was thinking yeah, earlier they, they came up with this thing of um, stuff being erased from time. And that was a fine idea. But I could see one of the reasons they were doing that is you want it to take place in the modern world and to be reasonably similar to our own, but in our modern, realistic world, there are no actual aliens, so somehow or other people have to either ignore or forget about, or it was erased from time, how many aliens have been contacting us in public fashion, and it's just an odd tension they have to play with, I don't know. Yeah, I still say that maybe they should be more concerned about an alien battle cruiser yeah. slamming into the beach. Yeah, you're right. I, it, it makes sense from your realistic standpoint. It would just throw off the vibe of the show. The weird part is that this show seems to vary between realistic points of view and cartoonish points of view. And it's kind of giving me whiplash at times. I think so. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad. It's just... Yeah, it's some, one of the things you have to accept for the show to work. Yeah, it's just kind of hard to keep track of what we're supposed to feel serious about. Oh no, something landed on the donut shop! Is this going to be a thing that impacts Sadie and Lars, the people who work at the donut shop? Or is this going to be a thing that's forgotten the next episode? Mm. I mean, I, I don't yeah. know. I can't make predictions. Yeah. Anyway, so Lapis flies off into space, because apparently she could fly at FTL velocities, which is amazing. Well, that, or I have my other theory that she's really patient, since it's revealed that gems are basically immortal. Yeah, it's It's, but... it's like elvish immortality, though. It's, we can't die unless we're killed. Uh, yes, but if we're going to do a dose of realism again, we've heard of gems living in through the thousands of years, and traveling at Lapis's apparent velocity just by eyeballing it on the screen is going to take billions of years to get to Alpha Centauri. Like, she is not moving at any fraction of light speed. <laughs> a very small fraction. A very small fraction of light speed. Way less than 1%. And if you were going at 1%, it would take 400 years to get there, which could be within gem patience term Let's levels. be fair to Lapis. She had major brain damage like five seconds before <laughs> she initiated right. this plan. I choose to believe... I just like the idea of creatures that can fly FTL without external support. Like, it's that idea that hasn't been explored very much in, uh, in uh, sci-fi. Well, I guess was... angels can do that from Evangelion. Yeah, although, personally, I always thought that the, it wasn't so much the angels that could do that so much as the eggs... Yeah, well, even so, they managed to get here. Well, my problem with Lapis having this ability is that, quite frankly, why do they need ships then? Well, I'm not, I assume that it's rare to be able to do that. Like, only Lapises can do that, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. Though, why don't they recruit a regular Lapis to come investigate Earth if they have trouble with the portals and stuff? But maybe no, they have a hierarchy. Maybe a Lapis is normally assigned to some other task, and they just can't be bothered changing up the rules of the hierarchy. That oh, yeah, just, this, this, this type of gem just happens to have FTL travel. Put them in charge of the sewers! Yeah, no, I, actually, I could see that. There could be some notion that we don't want these people to be 
free on their own too much because they've they're too good at traveling you know what i mean like we don't want them to like do stuff we're not aware of well later it's implied that gems are artificial life forms and that they're created by the diamonds or whoever so is it possible to create hmm so is it possible to create something and then instill a personality of total subservience that's what apparently they they haven't they haven't got total subservience because there was a rebellion and there's no hint of like, oh, we turned off the mind control machine or something. Like, apparently they don't have full control over the personality. They just give you abilities or something. I don't know exactly how the design well, I'm just process saying works. That the, gem, the gem Hadar over in Deep Space Nine weren't just loyal to the founders because of their drug addiction. That was a part of it, but it was just an extra layer of control because they were biologically programmed to defer to the founders. Look at the episode where they found a baby Jem Hadar. Without ever meeting Odo before, he sees Odo, who is a founder, and immediately kneels and acts subservient to anything that Odo demands of him. Right. I just don't think that's how it works here. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, if you have a race of immortal super beings ruling your empire in a fascistic manner, yeah, I think you'd have the time to figure out how to do that, especially since you're evil. Yeah, but, like, you know, we, we don't know. Strip we... mine worlds for resources. Right, but there's a difference between physical mining and mental, uh, you know, alterations. And maybe they're just not good at the second one. They don't have the tech oh, for that. Oh, right. Know. You know, they just have the ability to create mutants. Mutants is a physical thing. I'm talking about the mental thing. You know it's different. Yes, yes. Just still, though. Hmm. These are the questions this show raises. Yeah. <laughs> so Lapis eventually returns with... Um, Jasper and Peridot. Apparently Lapis got captured or something. This is a little unclear because Lapis sends us a message where she's like, there's a gem who's not looking for you. And she even knew your name. And I didn't tell her, I swear. And that gem is obviously Peridot because she previously talked to Steven on video link and Steven mentioned his name. Yeah, we have, we go. Uh, but then, okay, so she says, I didn't tell him, I swear. But then maybe she got captured right after that call and they forced her to tell them the location of the temple or something. Maybe she got arrested for having too much free will. Yeah. Anyway. Hmm. Anyway, so they arrive on a ship that is made of... That looks like a giant hand and is made of green emerald stuff. And they come down... Jasper comes down and kicks all of their asses. Uh, Then it's revealed that Garnet was a fusion all along. We haven't discussed that, but gems can fuse together. Yeah, it's a neat thing. Defuse. It's a character building thing. It also gets you to play with new character designs and abilities in a way that feels very natural. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just an interesting concept, but it turns out that Garnet was a fusion between two gems, Ruby and Sapphire. And we later hear the backstory of how Ruby and Sapphire met. Yeah, but we're that's a little in the future. Yeah, okay. Uh, they blow up the ship, they free Lapis. They sing an awesome song, or rather Garnet sings. Yeah, and everything is great, right up until Japs- Jasper emerges from the wreckage of the ship, which, I would like to remind you, this alien battlecruiser just crapped, craps, crap, flap, crashed, crap, <laughs> crashed and exploded right next to a town, and again, no one will comment on this later. What do they put the wreckage of this stuff? Well, the windows of the big donut were broken, and there is... I don't know. The wreckage of that stuff that Gems explicitly cleaned up, I can only assume they threw it into the ocean or something. Or maybe kept it in another room in the temple. They seem to be able to expand that. Yeah. Hmm. 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 Well, anyway, Jasper forcibly fuses herself to Lapis. Lapis has control of the oceans and is full of hatred. Yep. This ends smashingly for everyone involved. She manages to make chains out of water to grab herself slash Jasper and take them both to the bottom of the ocean. Because, of course, It was so cool. It was like Godzilla getting defeated by the ocean somehow. Like, ah, I'm being pulled back. Side note. Remake of Moana except Godzilla's there. Fighting fighting Tahiti. Wow. (laughs) Tahiti. Yeah, whatever that was. (laughs) <laughs> Godzilla versus the island <laughs> right yes. so let's see um, I guess that that means the end of them for now for now stuff continues to happen and eventually it's revealed that Peridot is still active on earth 
and that she's trying to escape because we blew up her spaceship. No, oh, yeah, we totally did that. Also, she's trying to escape because this planet is about to blow up. Yeah, she reveals that the Diamond Authority decided to plant a thing called the Cluster in there. When we say in there, we mean the center of the planet. Yeah, although it's not really the center because it's in the mantle. Um, well, deep down in the planet at least. It's a little unclear to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, eventually this leads to Peridot forming a truce with the Crystal Gems, and looking back on it, that was kind of a fast... Peridot eventually joins the Crystal Gems by the end of the season, and in fighting against the Diamond Authority, but that seems like kind of a fast conversion for her, given that she came to Earth to look up on, the, on how the mutant crystal demon abomination things... We're going. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it turns out that after the rebellion kicked out the uh, kicked out the gem empire stuff, the Diamond Authority decided to still use Earth as a test bed for various weapons and scientific research that they deemed, you know, really dangerous or horribly unethical. One of which was taking shattered gems fragments and gluing them together where they would grow into a new horrible abomination. Yeah, several several small abominations and then one multi-million gem shard cluster thing that will abominate the entire planet and kill everything. Yeah, so that's fun. I think this is known as a scorched earth strategy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this brings to mind my other question to the diamonds. Why don't they just take Venus? They have terraforming technology. We see it later. Why not take a planet that's not filled with monsters and organic life? Well, And first... defended by crystal gems. Just move over to the next planet. You have casual FTL travel. Your energy requirements are enormous. You can meet them. Just go to the next planet and start building there where Rose Quartz isn't fucking shit up for you. <laughs> um... So, we do see that the gems, their physical forms, have limits. Obviously, they can be stabbed and stuff. Do they also react to temperature, I believe? Yeah, they may actually need a planet in a habitable zone. <laughs> Otherwise, they all poof as soon as they land on Venus or whatever. Yeah, but then Peridot says that they are a spacefaring race. They adjust to the gravity of every planet. She doesn't say they adjust to the temperature of every planet. Yeah, but they could just stay up in the upper atmosphere and use the terraforming technology from there. Yeah, maybe. But then there's a separate question of different planets may have different compositions that they like better. Mm. Some stuff is easier to access or something. I guess it really goes down to the old question of why do you need to invade the Earth when there's plenty of resources in the asteroid belt? Uh, it'd be a lot easier to mine Mars than the asteroid belt, right? I mean, the asteroids are all miles apart from each other. It's just annoying. Well, yes, I'm just saying that a single asteroid is miles thick. You have plenty uh, of resources there, and no one's going to annoy you while you're doing it. Yeah. I would like to see a story where someone persuades the alien to just go colonize Mars, and, and then there's a sequel where they just set up diplomatic relations with the new Martian government, and like, all right, everything works. <laughs> uh, that'd be fun <laughs> uh yeah so apparently the diamonds are bastards oh yeah oh yeah we eventually see how much when they go to the moon because of course they go to the moon to the moon on a lion yeah Stephen has a magical lion with a hammer space mane yeah that was awesome yep he calls it lion because apparently he's still a crystal gem at heart and sucks at naming things <laughs> Oh. At least the fusions have names, like Rainbow Quartz. They didn't just call her Pearl Rose or something. Yeah, but there's <laughs> Sugalite and... All yeah, those are all... I don't know how they come up with the names. Like, they always have to name themselves, or half the time have to name themselves after minerals when some of these uh, fusions have never been done before. They just sort of psychically know which mineral they need to be named after. Huh. Anyways... Uh, when they're on the moon, Peridot reveals what the ultimate plan for the Earth was. They plan to hollow it out, except for the crust, uh, where there will be massive gaping holes in the crust, and massive megastructures will be placed all around and on the planet's surface, 
terraforming it into a massive megastructure in space that will serve as just another colony in the Empire. I gotta say, this actually horrified me. Hmm. Not because of what it implies, that the diamonds are utterly heartless monsters that will spend however long it takes to achieve their goals, even to the point of waiting to hollow out a planet. That is horrifying in and of itself, but the scale and resources needed to do this, and the implication that this is just another world that they've conquered and terraformed in the name of their empire. That there are multiple other mega structure level things sitting out there waiting the diamonds only allow the crystal gems to exist because they are an annoyance not a threat yeah <laughs> you get the sensation that if the diamonds actively wanted the crystal gems dead they would come down on them like the hammer of god yeah this is more or less the explanation as to why they're so freaked out at the existence of lapis lazuli yeah, as uh, well as Peridot, because they're terrified of the gem of the diamonds actively deciding, fuck you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It got to the... It gets to the... One of the things I tend to do when I watch or, or read or play something is compare the relative tech level and or methods of fighting or methods of doing anything to other works of media. Now, normally with things like Magical Girl shows, I tend to go for the low-end stuff, low to mid, like XCOM or something. This goes straight up into high-end stuff. This is Call the Doctor, Bring Out Unicron, yeah. Summon the Forerunners. Those are not things that are small for me. These guys freak me out so much, I'm calling in the big guns. Because I think those are the actual only ones that could actually stand a chance against them. Yeah. And the detail I didn't notice on my second viewing, when Garnet is stargazing, she mentions, look, you can see Homeworld's galaxy from here. So apparently they're from a different galaxy. They were intergalactic just to get to this colony. Well, I mean, okay, that's likely. Then again, it wouldn't be the first time someone screwed up. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Uh, for example, the creators of original Battlestar Galactica did not know the difference between galaxy and solar system. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That is so basic. I know. I am aware. Yeah. Did they say something like, uh, there's the sun at the center of our galaxy? <laughs> uh, unless they're using a really heliocentric model of the universe. Oh, no, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, apparently, they're transgalactic. That's beyond even the Forerunners. The only yeah, uh, the only groups that I can think of that did something like that were uh, the, either the Ori or the Alterans from Stargate, and they didn't have nearly this level of megastructure planning. Uh, yeah. I'm also thinking of, they do multiple galaxies in Doctor Who, but that's just about the rest I can think of. Everyone else is within a single galaxy. Yeah. It's freaky. So, good job making that, uh, those villains look big and powerful and scary, and we still haven't learned a dang word about White Diamond, who might be the biggest and scariest of them all. There's a big old world where this started to explore, I gotta say. I, I, would, I hope that White Diamond is actually smaller than Steven. <laughs> All the other giant diamonds? No, that no. was her attempt at compensation. I want White Diamond to be like Unicron style. <laughs> Just like, We're going to go meet White Diamond and she shows up like, oh, very large. Okay. Yeah, although I'm not convinced that she's planet sized on the basis that Peridot still thinks that Yellow Diamond is the best. And quite honestly, Peridot does not strike me as the type of person who goes... Okay, yeah, you make really good decisions, but planets. Yeah, all right. Ah. Well, then again, it's possible she's just never seen White Diamond and it's no idea. Maybe Homeworld is White Diamond. Oh, wow. That'd be amazing. We'll just get you to Cron to fire. It'll work. Yeah, yeah, he would. He would eat her. <laughs> he would. Although, personally, I think that she's the same stature as the other diamonds on the basis that she wouldn't delegate out the responsibility to the other diamonds otherwise uh it's possible but i don't know it's mystery we like the slow world building right yeah um jesus uh, eventually peridot tries to contact yellow diamond and burns all her bridges that way 
Yeah, because she tells... Well, there's a whole controversy where she's apparently trying to contact Yellow Diamond and all, everyone assumes that she's trying to betray the group. And then she finally says to Yellow Diamond, uh, hey, can we maybe mine the planet without killing everything? And Yellow Diamond's like, no, we want to kill everything. Screw that place. Yeah, Yellow Diamond doesn't really give a reason for why she hates Earth. Well, I, I think the reason is she's still pissed off about the rebellion. Yeah, but then there's, like, proportional response. You know, the, she's pissed off about the rebellion, so she does not flood the planet with soldiers and battle cruisers to wipe out any and all traces of resistance, but she does plant hyper-weapons and yeah. planet busters. To her, it's all the same, except this one's actually easier, because she doesn't have to send off so many soldiers. So, blow up the planet, what do I care? She doesn't, they don't care about organic life. So for her, it's just a big old rock, we don't give a damn. The end. We're skipping over a lot of stuff just because this show is incredibly detailed and incredibly dense. Mm -hmm. Did we watch all of season two? I believe we did. Yes. Okay, cool. We watched all of season two and we're not even, we didn't even scratch on the kindergarten. We didn't touch on the uh, fight that Pearl and Garnet had about fusion. Oh yeah. That was that. They, Garnet stayed mad for like three or four episodes. Yeah. Continuity. Nice. Yeah, and it's clear that she still doesn't forgive her entirely. It's just that she's moving on. Mm -hmm. Good enough to work together. and Yeah, relationships building. And uh, and now Paradox part of the group. Yeah. <laughs> we actually do. It's kind of weird that we get to see Paradox the way she became part of the group after she left the Diamonds. Yeah, I can only assume that maybe they felt if they gave you that before her complete heel face turn, that maybe it'd be too obvious the heel face turn was coming. Because mm -hmm. they really try to throw you a fake out where Garnet gives a little speech to Steven about how, uh, you know, not everyone is worthy of redemption, not everyone deserves your patience. And I honestly thought when I first saw it that that was going to be the. The, the thing, Steven would have to learn, because he's a very innocent character. He was going to have to learn for once that some people just aren't going to be your friend no matter how many try attempts you give them. And that's what's known as a family-unfriendly Aesop, but it's one that I think needs to be pushed through a little more. I mean, yes, it's a good thing to tr always try to see the best in people, but some people are ultimately not going to yeah, take like, your side. But once in a while, you you in real life this happens, you're dealing with someone in your life who's just a complete narcissist or even a psychopath and you needs to put up a wall of some point otherwise they're just going to wreck things how to train your dragon do had something of this message like hiccup tried to reach out to caldor no not caldor drago just drago drago Bloodfist. i'm sorry caldor drago is master of the gray knights chapter of the space marines oh i like to see you reach out to caldor drago <laughs> oh my god i would love to see t emperor text-to-speech device caldor drago Woo! in the <laughs> dragons can be our hello young boy hello young marshmallow have oh, you seen man. my beard i'm gonna go with it is full of <laughs> tiny men kill them all I, wanna... I really wish that that wasn't a direct quote from Caldor Drago from Text to Speech Device. Really? <laughs> yeah, he's basically the backstory behind Caldor Drago is that in continuity, in the main canon, he is, well, he was cursed by a demon to be shoved into the warp, which is a psycho, hy hyperactive, psychedelic tripscape where everything is made of madness and insanity. And in canon, he has been running around fighting demons and. Winning victories against the Chaos Gods. Text-to-speech device decided, hey, wait a minute, since he's running around in what is essentially super hell with insanity, he's not going to remain sane. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He might hate the demons, but he's not going to be normal. Uh, also, I want to see Imperials versus Homeworld gems now. Right? Two massive empires duking it out. Uh, okay, going to have to clarify that. Oh. Well. The Galactic Empire from Star Wars is what you're saying? No, I meant uh, the one you were just talking about. The Imperium of Man, or whatever. Oh, called. the Imperium of Man, yes. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know how else to refer to them except Imperials. Uh, no, Im Imperium is generally... Wait, uh... Hmm. What's the demonym of the Imperial of Man? I don't know, they just tend to refer to it as an Imperium. Okay, well, those guys. Because they'd be hardcore. <laughs> Yeah. I could see them taking on 
uh, gems and trying also to stop have, the diamonds. Also, they have planet busting weapons. So right, helps. right. It, it equals it out. It's a grudge match. Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, wow. So I'm looking forward to season three because I have no idea what's going to happen. You now. have some idea because you got a bunch of spoilers before we started. Yes, because some guy said, okay, you need to stop making jokes about the Vager being fighting Steven Universe. Yeah. So I said, I saw it. It was just a bunch of slice of life stuff with crappy magical girl shenanigans. And then he showed me some stuff and I was like, okay, this looks <laughs> like it's relevant to my interests. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm very impressed at how they weave together the slice of life with the epic action and how, like, yes, if you really think about it, there's some tension there with, like, why aren't the feds involved to get the military out of here, there's aliens and all that, but I'm willing to take the, uh, the premise and run with it and then be like, oh, the both sides really inform each other, you know, mm -hmm. how the people got together in their slice of life environments uh has shows us something about how they'll interact in the more tense and dangerous environments it's meaningful exactly um so when people have asked me what's this show about i i give the very short pitch of it's kind of like relaxed superheroes where they save the world but they also like jam out in a ukulele <laughs> yep and that's really nice and, nice and um i was I'm comparing it to the cartoons uh of, of the past and um you know, comparing it to like, I don't know, G.I. Joe or something, and be like, this has got, first off, higher production values and raw animation, the amount of number of songs they can write and so forth. Uh, and also, so much greater emotional intelligence. Getting into all these issues of, of feeling abandoned or, or self hatred and judgment and, and so many layers. All the characters have interesting pairings with each other. Connie's got a unique relationship with Steven's dad because they're both full human. Which is something even Steven doesn't share with his dad, being a half human. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, this the, the, uh, one of my favorite episodes is Alone Together, where Stevani first emerges. Steven and Connie fuse, not knowing previously they could even do that. And it's like this this idea of suddenly finding yourself in a new identity and getting to take on a new name and persona and stuff and, and exploring that is a really interesting idea and very sweet and. Uh, there's so many just emotional character notions that get explored in this show that don't, you know, we don't assume to get explored by cartoon shows. And here it is, like, really intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say Batman the Animated Series was ahead of its time in how deep it would get into, mostly into the villains. Uh, Heart of Ice, for instance, and, and oh, famous yeah. episodes like that. And uh, we are currently watching Batman Beyond, the sequel series to that. Oh, yeah. We should get around to that sometime. Um... But, like, most shows would, you know, they have a message. Really, the, the more you know section at the end, or knowing is half the battle, or the, mm -hmm. you know, here's our moral lesson to sort of tacked on, because we couldn't really figure out how to express this in detail. <laughs> we'll just tell you explicitly what you're supposed to know, kids. To be fair, this, is, this was also part, that was kind of forced onto the thing, so that it wouldn't be all, okay, kids, the only way to solve your problem is through violence. Sure, sure, I get that. That but... was the imposed on them by the moral guardians I, and I, let's also be fair my little pony friendship is magic also does this although i think it's a little more cynical than even that i think it's primarily there to keep the ei rating i mean maybe but with my little pony and with steven universe the lessons feel a lot more baked in in fact my little pony is more explicit than steven universe because they'll have like you know the letter at the end of the show or at least they used to of uh, here's the explicit lesson for the day and Steven Universe is more of just it's baked into the plot. It feels more natural. I love that. I, I think it's a little better handled in Steven Universe. Mm, I could say that. Yeah, I could see why you'd say that. Um, and not just because of the space stuff. And not just because of the space. Because of space. I mean, you know, awesome. I love space. You know, anything to get more of that sweet, delicious Babylon Five feeling. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, My Little Pony sometimes feels less mature. Than uh, Steven Universe yeah, does. Yeah, I guess, I guess on average it aims to a, a little bit of a younger audience, so obviously. It catches a wide net, and that's another thing that's going on in modern cartoons is they found ways to appeal to a pretty wide uh, age group, and that's nice, you know. It doesn't have to be as segregated as it was. Oh, this is just for kids or, or whatever. So, 
yeah, there's a reason this show's so popular and why I'm still a fan and uh, why we watched two seasons over the course of two days. And we'll see about catching up to the rest of it. And then you and I can speculate on what will happen next. Unicron. Unicron! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that's everything for now. Because okay. if we went even further, we would die. <laughs> oh, no. Don't do that. Okay. okay, well, anyways, I guess we're done. So I'm Sith King. And I'm Sonic Sons. Signing off.